Joining us now on the desk is Warren Ingram from Galileo Capital. Thank you, Warren, for joining us. I know you were listening in on the conversation with Eugene Kherson. Tell us your thoughts on preference shares and how they impact a portfolio. Well, I mean, I think it's a nice story to talk about while um, while, while interest rates are low and, and you know and everyone's looking for some kind of income. Um, my concern always with preference shares is that they don't beat inflation. So so it's a it's a nice story to say to somebody, you know, great, you get a nice after-tax return, it's better than cash, but uh, but that should make up five five percent. Of, of an investor's portfolio. You know, if you're piling in here now because you're worried about stock market volatility, when, when the market's so cheap, I think you can get companies with dividend yields of 5%, you mm. know, uh, and, and, that, and that'll grow, that'll beat inflation. Why, why would you be going into preference shares? Mm. With regards to the benchmark used across the board, you're talking about beating inflation, and I, I've heard from a lot of investors that the long-term goal is essentially to beat inflation. Is that your, your big benchmark that you focus on over the long term for many of your clients? Yeah. Would you say that that is the fair benchmark to have? Yeah. Well, so it's not really a benchmark, it's more like a target, but nevertheless. So, so any, anybody who's, who's sort of built up an asset base or who's, who's already retired, th their biggest threat in life is, is inflation. So, so as long as their capital and the income they're drawing from their capital is tracking or beating inflation, th th that's really what they're most worried about or, or should be most worried about. Mm. So certainly, I mean, uh, uh, whereas somebody who's young and starting to save, then, then perhaps their benchmark would be closer to the, the stock market or you know the, the overall index. But but certainly for most people with capital ready, they, they want to preserve capital, not to take massive risk. Mm. Andrew, your sense on the comments made by Warren with regards to preference shares, as you yeah, mentioned, you do have exposure. We we do have to exposure preference to preference shares, um, and our exposure is as I suggested, it's there just to enhance yield. We have pretty small positions in preference shares. I think they they do offer a yield enhancement, but I think what is often also missed is they actually carry more volatility than you might expect. They are closer aligned to equity volatility. Mm. Eugene uh, said though it's, it's half the volatility that he was He said to. half, and I, I mean I don't want to throw out a number uh, to to uh, sort of knock his, his observation about half, but it's higher than people think. You You often, not you, I think one is at risk of thinking you're buying a tax-free income with bond or cash like well, cash doesn't have volatility bond like volatility but when the market gets wobbly and cast your mind back to 08 preference shares which for the most part are issued by financial institutions carry far higher volatility than you mm -hmm. might expect and the point that Warren makes about inflation I think is critically important you say you need to beat inflation if you're retired uh, and it's probably less of, a, of an objective for younger people who should be looking for something more aggressive. Mm. I agree with that. However, for all investors, you need real growth in your capital, regardless of whether it's a lot or a little, uh, how aggressive you want to be. If you're not beating inflation over meaningful investment periods, yeah. necessarily you're going backwards. and that is exactly contrary to what you're trying to achieve. I mean, if someone arrives at, at my door asking me about beating uh, inflation with very low risk, uh, and, and I mean, I, I always ask them why, for example, they don't consider the government's retail bonds. You know, I mean, if, they, if they're really risk averse, you can buy a government inflation linked yeah. bond, sure, you're gonna pay tax, but, but it's guaranteed by government. That's far less risk in a preference share, and, and pay your tax and, and be done with it. You, you, at least you know your risk is virtually zero. Mm. Let's on, onshore versus offshore. The round is weakened to above eight to the US dollar. Yeah. What does one do now? We bring money back home. What is your sense? Uh, I mean, I think that it's a perennial question investors in South Africa always face. And, and my view is always the same. Is you, you go offshore because, because you need asset class diversification. It shouldn't be a trading position. It, it's mm. so difficult to predict what, what the international markets are going to do from a stock market point of view. Then you add currency into the equation and, and your, your risks of getting it wrong are massive. So, so I always say, I mean, if you, if, you need, if you need to bring money back and it's something that you have to do in terms of reposition, repositioning your assets then then bring it back now and be done with it but don't trade don't trade the currencies you, you can't make money what percentage of your portfolio should be um, allocated to foreign or offshore uh, I, I would say as a standard benchmark if, if you're not going to spend a lot of your time overseas and this is home and this is where you plan to spend your your, your time and your money then you need about 15 percent of your of your portfolio offshore if you plan to spend let's say half a year overseas because that's what you want to do in life, then, then obviously more. But, but what people always forget about our market, our stock market, is it's already so rand-hedged. If you look at our major, the major shares,
companies in our in our market, they earn a large part of their money overseas already. Mm. So so now if you say to somebody go and get fifty percent of your money offshore and you know invest in the JSC, you're probably ending up with seventy five or eighty percent exposure mm. offshore. Mm. Are you talking about EMs uh, as well as the, the developed world as well when you talk about you know offshore? Investments. Well, well, I, I would say just out of out of South Africa into the developed world. So, so more developed world than emerging markets. Mm. Uh, sure, mm. sure. Um, I share Warren's views. The, the the biggest mistake investors make. We're all rand obsessed. The rand's weak. Let's okay. leave. The rand's strong. Let's bring it all home. But the point about going overseas is not about is the rand at six or eight. It's about buying assets there overseas that you just can't get in South Africa. You can't buy. Uh, an Intel comparator in South Africa or a Toyota or BMW comparator. You're buying different asset exposure, which will give your portfolio a different return stream. And I think that's, that's important. If you are taking your money overseas based on a forecast of the RAND, then you're going to get it very right or very wrong. I and it's a bit of a lot. Um, <laughs> are you investing in indices overall in the developed market or are you looking at uh, stock specific investments? No, I, I, I mean, I think it's so expensive for South Africans to get uh, overseas equity exposure that, that I love uh, indexation for, for your international exposure. I just think, uh, um, I think that's a far cheaper way for, for the average South African to do it. Typically, most of the time when a South African goes overseas, uh, they're paying about two, two and a half percent per annum on some kind of managed fund and and they've that's over and above the, the commissions they pay to actually convert their rands to mm. dollars pounds or euros which could be another two percent mm. so so from my point of view uh, if you get to the major uh, equity indices uh, it's, it's a far better view the s p 500 index is officially in bear territory they say it's down 20 percent so far this year would you be investing in the s p 500 at uh, this point um, I'm, I'm i'm one of those guys that's a difficult indexation guy i like smart indices so i like indices that are not pure market ah. cap weighted so so if you give me a, a, a US RAFI type index uh, I'm far happier with something like that than a pure market cap index mm. and for you Andrew I know that you have specific stocks abroad mm. how do you get over the uh, the cost that is incurred in having well, the cost is operation? a big obstacle when going overseas I mean Warren's put out some numbers and I would agree with those the way that we do it is in the equity space I think it's far easier to extract value add than if you're going into bonds property cash it's very difficult to try and get some excess return out of those asset classes and so I would definitely share your view about the indexed uh, plan of attack um, from our side we do have active equity funds and what you are looking for similar to our thinking in South Africa is a sound business that's priced attractively um, yeah, do, do you want to follow a cap weighted index? I would agree that yeah. is not really helping your cause. You want something that has some kind of a fundamental slant, RAFI uh, or, or is, uh, they call them fundamental indices. I think those are far more sensible and you are achieving a bit more than just tracking an index. Fantastic gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Thank you so very much for joining us. Great yeah. to have you on the program. Warren Ingram from Galileo Capital and of course a big thank you to my co-host this evening, Andrew Newell from Canon Asset Manager.